Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya mursaleen Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa man wala. And I have the distinct honor of introducing Sheikh Muhammad al-Yaqubi, who is no stranger to the Bay Area. He has visited the area numerous times and has conducted classes at the Zaytuna Institute in Hayward in the early 90s. Sheikh Muhammad, in my opinion, exemplifies combining the Islamic scholarly tradition in which he was raised and reared through his father and some of the great scholars of Damascus, Syria, and also with the highest levels of Western academia in his studies as well. I'll just share with you anecdotally, I first met Sheikh Muhammad when I was studying in Damascus in the late 90s. As students in Damascus, we had the honor of inviting him to speak at our Eid dinner. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to bless us with his presence. I was also blessed to spend time with him in the Rawdah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in 2000, in, sorry, in 1999. And then, however, my fondest memory and image of Sheikh Muhammad was when we were with him in the Alhamra Masjid in 2000 in Spain, where we were blessed to hear him teach the Shema'al of Imam Tirmidhi for the entire month of August. And he brought us on that day into the courtyard of Alhamra Masjid, and we prayed the Asr prayer in the courtyard. And Sheikh Muhammad as is customary with all of us in our prayer, after making the sajda, the prostration in the courtyard, in the dirt, in his gleaming white clothing, and his turban, I remember this image, it's impressed in my mind, that he continued, he just turned and picked up the book and began to teach. And to me, that was an exemplary, that was the personification of humility of the prophetic character, and we ask Allah to continue to bless him and to bless us, ameen. So as we said, we are blessed to have Sheikh Muhammad with us this evening, continue to learn from him. He has been unwavering in his work to help the people of Syria as this tragedy continues to unfold, and his voice has become one of the most prominent voices with regard to this issue. He is passionate about this subject, and this passion is what led him to write, to write this book his translation of his own work, which is titled Refuting Isis. He says about this book, and I quote, Refuting Isis was written to clarify the position of Sunni Islam against Isis and provide a much needed scholarly response to the ideological challenges that this group presents. The plethora of proofs to destroy ISIS's ideology have till date been, confirmed, been confined to classical texts. This book was written to make these proofs accessible to the average reader in an easy to read handbook. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to protect Sheikh Muhammad and bless him in his work. Honored guests this evening, please join me in welcoming Sheikh Muhammad Al Yaqubi. الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Respected Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته قال الله تبارك وتعالى يؤتي الحكمة من يشاء ومن يؤتى الحكمة فقد أوتي خيرا كثيرا Allah says what means Allah gives wisdom to whom he chooses. Anyone who is given wisdom is given a lot of good. Refuting ISIS is the title of my new book, which is based on the simplistic approach to an ordinary Muslim reader and an ordinary non-Muslim curious reader who is seeking some basic knowledge about Islam. 
especially about the hot topics which the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq, referred to later on as ISIS, poses in our modern times. The book is uh, quite short and brief and was intended as a fatwa, a legal ruling for two things. Number one, proving that ISIS followers have deviated from Islam. Second, that fighting them to put an end to their challenge and their threat is the obligation of the Muslim Ummah. For that reason, I didn't go deep into a critical study of uh, the proofs which ISIS uses. In the methodology of debate, we have three means, man'a, naqd, and mu'arada, which means challenging the proofs which the opponent provides, or providing equal proofs, or providing stronger proofs. I went to the third method directly. So for every controversial issue, so as it seems, I provided a counter narrative, as you may say in the English language, that destroys the foundation of what ISIS claims. I'm telling you how the book is written because I wanted the book to be easily read by an ordinary Muslim without having to tackle issues related to the methodology of hadith or jurisprudence, usul al-fiqh. Any Muslim hears about burning Muslims alive or burning human beings alive or torturing them by fire, which ISIS did with the Jordanian martyr pilot Mu'adh al kasasba Allah have mercy on him. Any Muslim who hears the hadith agreed upon in Al-Bukhari and Muslim, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam states that do not torture by fire. Torturing by fire belongs to Allah. No one does this but Allah, it's enough for any ordinary Muslim to be convinced that it is forbidden in Islam to torture by fire. However, for scholars and for people who want deeper knowledge, I have written another book, which I hope in due time will be out. It's over 300 pages which goes in detail to discuss every proof or text or what seems to be a valid evidence ISIS provided and destroyed, destroyed systematically from its foundation. Let's say, and let us start by tackling the issue of burning human beings by fire or torturing by fire. I think people in the West, non-Muslims, are tired of us coming on TV screens like CNN and other satellite channel news channels saying that this is not Islam. Islam denounces this. They're tired. These are common statements. Every Muslim leader, every Muslim scholar says this. They want some deeper analysis, and these studies are not accessible usually by the commons. What I tried in this book to do is bringing, digging deep into the Muslim corpus of law to find texts, references, apart from, of course, the Book of Allah 
and the prophetic tradition, the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, to provide proofs to show the real image of Islam, which is based on the middle way, the way of mercy, the way of respect to the other, the way of protecting human life, human dignity, and all human values. So in this issue of burning by fire, you find ISIS taking a proof from the hadith which is in Sahih al-Bukhari that Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu ta'ala an burned people by fire. Some of his enemies, in one narration, it is an apostate. In some narrations, it is people who worshipped him or claimed that he is God. Different narrations. And also, some narrations suggest that he burned them while they were alive. Some narrations suggest that he burned them after he killed them. This is the major proof which ISIS uses in this regard as a proof or used as a proof to validate or justify their burning of uh, the Jordanian pilot alive. It's an invalid proof. And it was the deep wisdom of Imam al-Bukhari to narrate this. And people who do not know the policy, the system, the system that, or methodology which Imam Bukhari used in his Sahih would speak of ignorance only. Imam Bukhari, when there is a hadith that is abrogated, he would include it in his book and narrate the abrogator. Sometimes pointing out to it, sometimes in the same section, sometimes in a different section. A clear example to this, the hadith of Sayyiduna Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala an, which Imam Bukhari narrates, that uh, when couples get together in bed, a man and the husband, uh, a man and the wife gets together in, uh, in bed, in their sexual intercourse, without ejaculation, they don't have to have a washing, a ghusl. It's in Sahih al-Bukhari, which is against the consensus of the four madhabs, which is against what has been established in, in fiqh. It was the opinion of Sayyiduna Uthman ibn Affan, who was the third Khalifa, who is son-in-law of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam twice. Yet it is not a valid opinion. It is abrogated. And Sayyiduna Uthman was not aware of it. Imam Bukhari narrated after it the hadith that proves إِذَا الْتَقَى الْخِتَانًا وَجَبَ الْغُسْلُ أَنْزَلَ أَوْ لَمْ يُنْزِلْ When people get together in a sexual intercourse, a man and his wife in a legal marriage, or whatever happens, even if it is haram, people have, these couple have to get ghusl. This is one simple example, and forgive me for mentioning such an example from the section of uh, purity. But to make clear how Islam is established, you don't just pick up a piece of tradition and take it as a proof. This is not your job. This is not my job. This is the job of the great imams. This is what is called ijtihad. Ijtihad is a very complex process that cannot be done by simple individuals. It has a lot of requirements. We have great minds in our Muslim history, such as Imam Ghazali, Imam al nawawi who never claimed that rank of ijtihad. And now in our modern days, we have fighters in Syria and Iraq, followers of ISIS, carrying guns, claiming to be mujtahids. They read the Quran on their own. They read the Sunnah on their own. And they become mujtahids. They decide what they want. This is the ruling of Allah according to them. Not only they are mujtahids, they are muftis, they are judges, and they are the executors. They do also execute the rulings. And they, don't, they do not wait. Sometimes all of this process is done in a minute or two minutes or five minutes and the person is killed. This is what we have nowadays. So when we have a hadith of Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu ta'ala an, no matter how strong it is, even if it is in Sahih al-Bukhari, we see Imam al-Bukhari documenting another hadith 
when the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alihi wa sallam forbade people when he saw some of his companions have burned a colony of ants. They burned a colony of ants, animals. Sometimes insignificant, but nothing is insignificant that Allah created. Great wisdom in the colony of ants. The most complex economic system Allah created is amongst ants in their colonies. No wonder we have a surah, chapter in the Quran called the chapter of the ant. When some of the Sahaba burned some colonies of ants, the Prophet ﷺ was angry and he forbade torturing animals by ant or torturing by, ant, by fire, using fire to torture. And said, فَإِنَّهُ لَا يُعَذِّبُ بِالنَّارِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ No one tortures by fire except Allah. Now who is going to go through this all process? It's not only just a simple reader, an ordinary Muslim. It has to be a mujtahid who has qualifications, especially when this hadith of Sayyiduna Ali is narrated. His cousin, Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Abbas, a great authority, opposed Sayyiduna Ali. And at that time, he was governor of Al-Basra. And he opposed Sayyiduna Ali and said, if it was me, I would not have burned them. The hadith is not valid as a proof. It shouldn't be taken as a proof, and no one took it as a proof. Indeed, some of the fuqaha misinterpreted some statements. And this is what I was talking about with Sheikh Hamza just now. When you go to the Mukhtasar of Khalil, for example, he says in the Mukhtasar that if someone tortures by fire, then he can be punished by retaliation using the same method which he used to kill. Now, in the Mukhtasar of Khalil, this is Al-Mashhur. And in the Madhab of Imam Malik, Al-Mashhur is the opinion of Ibn Al-Qasim, who is the narrator of the Mudawwana of Imam Malik. Ibn Al-Qasim himself added to the Mudawwana a lot. You see in Al-Mudawwana a lot of his own interpretation, a lot of his addition to what Imam Malik said. And it, at a certain period of time in Andalusia, the narration of Ibn al-Qasim was given priority over all other narrations from Imam Malik and was given, was made mashhur, the most known opinion. When it is not sometimes, especially when Imam Malik himself did not state this. Imam Malik himself never stated that uh, a killer, a murderer who uses fire to murder his a person is to be killed by retaliation using the same method. It was the analogy which Ibn al-Qasim used. This is why I would like to call from this pulpit here, from this academy, and I would like to congratulate Sheikh Hamza and Daytona Institute for the accreditation. This is my first visit here after it happened. Inshallah, Allah grants Zaytuna a lot of prosperity and a lot of glory to produce real scholars of Islam to serve the deen and spread it in this land and in the world in the best way, the way of the heirs of the Prophet Al-Ulama Warathatu Al-Anbiya The ulama are the heirs of the Prophet and in as much as they have knowledge, they have mercy because the message of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was but mercy so it's very important in this regard here to relate things together. There is some gap which we need to fill in. And this is what I would call renewal of fiqh. Renewal of fiqh could be done in, in various ways. The way renewal of fiqh or reform of fiqh is done today is a random way. That is to say, every scholar thinks of a subject, writes about it, and then produces a piece of tradition like what you heard I spoke about last time here, the implementation of Islamic penalties and how I tackled this issue in the four madhabs. I believe this is a very limited way. The difference between us and groups like ISIS, us, mainstream Islam, is that we do not follow one single scholar. 
they follow Ibn Taymiyyah strictly and they got misled because of following one person whose fatwas may not be fitting for this time. And I have a proof to this, his fatwa against the Tatar, for example, was used by ISIS to execute Qabila al-Shaytat tribe, al-Shaytat tribe in the eastern territories of Syria in their Zor, who rebelled against ISIS. They used the fatwa of Ibn Taymiyyah, which he issued against Tatar. And they considered al-Shaytat as a fi'a, murtadda, that shawka, exactly like the Tatar, and they judge that they should be killed, their wealth is looted, their women, children to be enslaved, and so on. The fatwa is not fitting. Even if you go to read the fatwa itself, the fatwa does not fit in this context. It, it addressed exactly the Tatar in that time. Now, there's a huge difference between following a man and following a school. The beauty about our madhabs, whether Hanafi, Shafi'i, Hanbali, or Maliki, is that we do not follow one Imam. The Maliki school is not the works of Imam Malik himself alone. He laid the foundation by establishing the principles, the general rules, and a lot later on was based on his principles. He didn't tackle everything. At certain points, scholars may differ with Imam Malik and go against his opinion. At one point, you find several interpretations of some of his texts in the madhab itself. So the Maliki school is not the works of Imam Malik. We do not follow Imam Malik literally. When we are Malikites, we follow a group of scholars which, ex which expands over at least 1,200 years. Probably the last greatest mufti was Al-Mahdi Al-Wazzani in his Al-Mi'yar Al-Jadid. In the Hanafi school of law, one-third of the mazhab, of the madhab, one-third of it, al-Sahiba and the two companions, students of Imam Abu Hanifa, Abu Yusuf Al-Qadi and Muhammad bin Hassan Al-Shaybani, differed with Imam Malik on it. You say I'm Hanafi, but in many cases, hundreds of cases, you're not following Abu Hanifa, you're following Abu Yusuf or Imam Muhammad. You say I'm Hanafi, but on 18 issues of the Hanafi school, you're following Imam Zufar, third most famous student of Imam Abu Hanifa. You say Hanafi, but you find Hanafi scholars in the fourth century in the Eastern Territories, especially in the Eastern Territories of the Islamic world, differed with Imam Abu Hanifa and gave fatwas against his opinions. And you're still Hanafi because these followed the rules which Imam Abu Hanifa laid down for jurists after him to use and implement. That's the beauty of the four Sunni schools of law. They have the elements of to evolve to develop over times. What we did actually is we froze these elements. The madhabs were frozen a hundred years ago, I would say, because the last attempt to develop a madhab from inside was done by Sultan Abdul Hamid, Allah have mercy on him, when he summoned a huge committee from the top scholars of the Islamic world Hanafi scholars of the Islamic world with a representative from each other school, every other school, to write what is known as Al-Majalla, Majallatul Ahkam Al-Adliya. Now what is specific about Majallatul Ahkam Al-Adliya, Sultan Abdul Hamid noticed the new challenges brought by contact with Europe. And the art of foreigners in the Islamic world under the Ottoman Caliphate, who needed a reference, an authority, a law book to follow. There wasn't any. So Hanafi scholars came together and wrote this majalla, which is 1841 articles, in a very simple language, getting away from all legal jargon, mentioning no differences of opinions, choosing what is most suitable for the time. 
They differed on several issues with, with what was already established as a fatwa opinion or reliable opinion in the madhab. They had the authority, they were the top scholars of their times. One of them was Alauddin ibn Abidin, the nephew of the author of Ibn Abidin, the author of the Hashia, the famous sub-commentary on Adr al-Mukhtar. And in the beginning of this majalla, they mentioned 99 rules of fiqh to put in the hands of every judge. One of them is Al-Umuru bi maqasidiha. So the judge should know that even if the letter of the law states so and so and so, he should look at the intention of the criminal or the intention of the defendant of the intention of and so on and so on. He looks at the, the purpose, the objective of the law. Is it achieved through this legal ruling or not? And many, many other rules, 99 legal rules to show the spirit of the law in order to establish this higher objective of the Sharia, which is of course Maqasid al-Sharia, the protection of the five major kulliyat, blood, life, honor, wealth, sanity, and religion. And we see in fiqh that when things get in conflict, life is always prior to wealth. Life is always prior even to religion. You may interrupt your prayer. If, you, if your shoes are stolen, you can interrupt your prayer and run even behind the thief. It's, you're not supposed to lose something when you come closer to God. There's no compromise on your life or on your wealth. This is why I call here that we need we need to produce in every madhab a new textbook. Khalil, okay, Khalil is a great work. Leave it for scholars now. Malikite scholars should summon nowadays to decide fiqh has changed. And the Maliki madhab itself, there is a lot of room inside it. In the Shafi'i school, in the Hanbali school. On many issues you find Imam Ahmad having two opinions, Imam Shafi'i of course having the old Docked the old school and the or opinions and new opinions after he migrated to Egypt. In the Hanafi opinion, there is a plethora of opinions on some one issue, on the same one issue, often. So every school has the potentials to produce a fiqh which is very suitable to our time. Unfortunately, no one is doing this because the last state that supported a certain school was the Ottoman Caliphate. And the only school which supports now, the only country which supports a certain school in the Islamic world is Morocco, supporting the Malikite Madhab and considering it its official doctrine. So there should be something done on this regard, in this regard, which producing a new textbook in the Hanafi school, in the Maliki school, in the Hanbali school, which fits in our time. We cannot use a text that was written or deduced 400 years ago, not even 200 years ago, because just the last century, 20th century, witnessed a huge shift in our lifestyle, in economy, in every aspect of our life. This is why here you find ISIS picking up. They choose what suits them. Sometimes they quote from the Hanafi books. Sometimes they quote from the Malikite books. They choose from verses from the Quran. They choose Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But their major approach, and this is a huge difference between us and ISIS and any group that adopts the same ideology as ISIS, is that they build their understanding on a literalist approach to sacred texts. On a literalist approach to sacred texts. And this is very dangerous. When Imam Sanusi in his book Al-Muqaddimat classified things which al-mukaffirat, which make people, get people out of Islam, one of them, al-iman bi ba'di dhawahir al-nusus, to believe in some text as is, as they are, without any attempt to understand the text. 
to interpret it, to put it in its context, to look at the surroundings, القرائن, circumstantial evidences around the text. And this is very dangerous. This is why, for example, you see them using If you're going to punish, punish in the same way you're being punished. So they take this verse as is. They, they make no analysis at all. So they, they just um, Im implement this and they used it actually in the literature when advocating the burning of the Jordanian pirate, which is very wrong. Because it's obvious, you go to the books of Tafsir, from a tabari and onward, they'll tell you that this book, this verse is revealed to show that war is, is legitimate. When someone attacks you, you may attack them. When someone wage, wages, someone wages a war against you, you can do the same. But war is legitimate but the details are not tackled. Anyone who transgresses against you, transgress against them in the same way or in a similar way they transgressed against you. Again here, it talks about war and fighting. It doesn't tackle the details and it doesn't state that someone who raped you, raped them, someone who did this, do this. Fuqaha tackled this and this is out of the question. Why? Because there are higher rules in the Sharia that bans these things. But this mutlaq and muqayyad and am and khas, as we understand some terms of jurisprudence, a text that is general, a text that is particular, a text that, is, uh, that has no limits, a text, a text that has been limited, these terms are far away, far fetched from the minds of these criminals who are led not by wisdom, but by anger, by hatred, whose goal is not research and the truth, his, whose goal is revenge. This is why we have reached a point where we're witnessing now something that has never happened in the history of Islam. And the problem is, it is done by the name of God. It is done by the name of God. They have stolen our deen from us. And then they don't care. Afterwards, they're using it. Actually, they're claiming to be gods. In that video which I quote here, it's still on YouTube. One Tunisian Friday speaker belongs to ISIS in one of the villages north of Raqqa, he delivers Friday khutbah, and he says in his Friday khutbah, if Muhammad comes, he would follow the Islamic State. Can you believe this? And he says, he knows what he's saying. He's telling, swearing by Allah, Wallahi, innana ala al-haq, by Allah I swear we are on the path of truth and he knows what he's saying and he's justifying it he's defending himself preparing to what he's going to say then he makes this statement that Muhammad is when he comes sallallahu alayhi wasallam has to follow them so th these people they want to be gods on the face of the earth and they can't do that without using religion without using Islam itself look at for example this huge slogan, Caliphate in the footsteps of prophethood. There are several fallacies here. Number one, we know from a sound hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Al-Khilafatu ba'di thalathun thumma takunu mulkan aduda, aw aduda. Caliphate after me is for 30 years. Afterwards, it would be monarchy or oppressive monarchy or tough monarchy. And these 30 years was the, 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 were the period in which the five orthodox caliphs fit. Sayyiduna Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Sayyiduna Umar ibn al-Khattab, Sayyiduna Uthman ibn Affan, Sayyiduna Ali ibn Abi Talib, and Sayyiduna al-Hassan ibn Ali. He fits exactly within these 
30 years. So to correct the misconception, the Orthodox Caliphs are five, not four. There is no more Caliphs until, according to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before the end of time, Al-Mahdi comes. Then the Khilafah will be established again. So anyone in between who claims to bring a Khilafah on the minhaj of the Prophet, well, there was a Khilafah, of course, the Umayyads. They were Khulafah, the Abbasids, they were Khulafah. And the Abbasids later on in Egypt, even by name, they were Khulafah, the Ottomans. They had power, they were Khulafa, but still to claim a Khilafa on Minhaj al Nubuwa is big claims. And no one did, the Umayyads did not do it, did not make these claims. And the Abbasids did not make these claims. It was Khilafa, but they never claimed they were, that they were rightly on the footsteps in, in the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And something here also that uh, uh, pulled my attention. Khilafatun ala minhaj al-nubuwa, not ala minhaj al-nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they don't care about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not in the footsteps of Rasulullah, in the footsteps of prophethood. So for them, prophethood is a, is a concept, and Muhammad is a man. He may be wrong for them, and they can correct him. So they choose prophethood as a, an abstract thing, and they decide what it means to follow. They are the farthest people from following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Because 12 centuries, the ummah followed the footsteps of these great imams we just mentioned, Abu Hanifa, Malik, Al-Shafi'i, and Ahmad. And these were for sure following the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because we know that they did not invent the deen from themselves and did not start a new school of law, but they followed up the footsteps of their teacher, Abu Hanifa, followed Hamad from Ibrahim and Nakhai, from Alqama and Al Aswad, from Al Sayyida Aisha, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Sayyiduna Ali, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, and Imam Malik, followed from Rabi'atul Ra'i, from Nafi', from Ibn Shihab al Zuhri, from Abdullah ibn Umar, and the other Sahaba, Al Fuqaha al Sab'a, in Al Madina al Munawwara, and from Sayyiduna Umar, radiallahu ta'ala, and other Sahaba. The same also for uh, Al Imam al Shafi'i with the students of uh, uh, Ibn Abbas. Ata, Ikrima, Qatada, and Abdullah ibn Abbas in Mecca, they did not invent something from their own minds. It's a non going process that lived from the time of the Prophet and moved on generation after another. One of the major issues which ISIS uses against Muslims is the principle of takfir. And this is very dangerous. And I mentioned in the Arabic edition one section about a takfir. And in the English edition, there are also some more. And by the way, the English edition is different from the Arabic edition. Because when the author is the translator, it's quite difficult to stick to the text. So what I did actually, there is in the English edition, there is a new preface, which I wrote for the English edition. Then there is a new section. I had the idea of writing it. In the words of ISIS, I quoted actually, they accuse Sheikh Hamza Yusuf of being an apostate. In some other also instances, they accuse Sheikh Abdullah ibn Baz, previous Mufti, former Mufti of Saudi Arabia, of being an apostate. And uh, here and there, you you might find some, some additions or some changes because I am the author, so I'm responsible for it. So I don't mind if the English is different from the Arabic. It would be just uh, mistrust if the interpreter is someone different. However, I'm still not happy because the editor actually changed some of my terms. And I'm quite careful when using the English language. So for Islamic penalties, for example, the editor changed my uh, word, Islamic penalties, and said capital penalty. <laughs> Uh, which is totally different from what I meant, and I didn't pay attention to the, to the changes the editor, uh, editor was supposed just to, to check the grammar and uh, the punctuation. Uh, anyway, next edition, there will be also some, uh, some more corrections. So however, the issue of takfir actually is quite a serious issue. And here I would like to mention 
uh, from this academic center some, some serious challenges we are having in the Islamic world. And I hope that they would be also understood in the context of doing great service to the Islamic world and its governments, especially the Saudi government. Because you know the Al-Qaeda, how it started. I hope you still remember. Because we still remember, we were following up the news in the 80s. Osama bin Laden was a great hero in Saudi Arabia and was supported by the Saudi government. Until 1989, he lived in Saudi Arabia and moved in and out very freely. It was in 1990 when Osama bin Laden moved to Sudan and rebelled against the Saudi government. What was the sparkling reason for that? It's not a hidden fact. It was the war to liberate Kuwait, Gulf War. So what was specific about it? It was the alliance based with some Arab countries, several Arab countries sent the troops, including Syria, Hafez Assad at the time, who made the U-turn and joined the U.S. to fight uh, Saddam because of the historical feud with uh, Saddam Hussein and the two uh, wings of the Ba'ath Party ruling in Syria and Iraq. However, what was specific about it was seeking assistance from non-Muslims against Muslims. Seeking assistance from non-Muslims against Muslims, which Osama bin Laden considered kufr, apostasy, heresy. It makes a Muslim non-Muslim. Who told him so? How come he was convinced by this? Actually, he was taught in Saudi schools. <laughs> he was taught this in Saudi schools. You know, the official doctrine of Saudi Arabia relies on the works of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. One of the major works of his is Nawaqidul Islam, a small booklet called Nawaqidul Islam. He sums up Nawaqidul Islam in 10, 10 principles he considers they annihilate, they, they reverse your religion. They bring you out of Islam or excommunicate you. The first one is shirk, associating other gods with God. Okay. No controversy about it. Second is having any means between you and God. So if you take Rasulullah as an intercessor between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you're kafir. Third, which, by the way, ISIS adopts Nawaqidul Islam al-Ashara of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab as they are, and they are teaching them now in all of their courses. And for irony, they are still taught in Saudi schools till today. So how do you expect not Saudis joining ISIS, rebelling against their own government when they are taught in their own school, that seeking assistance from non-Muslims makes you non-Muslims. It's an irony. Although Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Baz, rahimahullah, tried to change, because he gave a fatwa, it's a very, very famous fatwa, he gave legitimacy to the war against Iraq by stating, and I quote the fatwa here in this book here, it's quoted, this is why I have the, section eight is seeking assistance from non-Muslims. This is section eight, and I have full refutation, and I quoted Imam Nawawi when he quotes also Imam al-Bukhari saying that we may seek assistance from non-Muslims. Even if there is any controversy, there is difference of opinion between the four Sunni schools on this issue, but it's illegal, not theological. And there's a huge difference. It's illegal, which is haram or halal. We are all Muslims. You say it's okay, I say no, it's not okay. Well. We're still all Muslims. I don't kill you, you don't kill me. This, 
This difference of opinion exists between the four Sunni schools based on proofs from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Famous hadith in Sahih Muslim, La astainu bi mushrik, someone wanted to help Muslims, a non-Muslim wanted to help Muslims during the Battle of Badr, the Prophet said, no, we don't, uh, I don't seek the assistance of a non-Muslim. But the person embraced Islam later on and joined and helped Muslims. So there is huge discussion about it because on the conquest of Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ also sought the assistance of non-Muslims such as Safwan ibn Umayyah and Ikrima ibn Abi Jahl. He borrowed from Safwan ibn Umayyah 200 armors. There are, there are further proofs to this issue. It's a detailed discussion which led scholars, imams like Imam Shafi'i to say, for example, when he says here, I said here, وَقَدْ ذَهَبَ جُمْهُورُ الْفُقَهَاءِ إِلَىٰ أَنَّهُ يَجُوزُ لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ فِي قِتَالِ أَهْلِ الضَّلَالِ مِنَ الْخَوَارِجِ الْبُغَاتِ عِنْدَ الضَّرُورَةِ الْاسْتِعَانَةِ بِمَنْ يَحْتَاجُونَ إِلَيْهِ مِنَ الْمُقَاتِلِينَ وَبِمَا يَحْتَاجُونَ إِلَيْهِ مِنَ السِّلَاحِ وَالْخِبْرَةِ مِنْ غَيْرِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ إِذَا لَمْ يَكُنْ ذَلِكَ عِنْدَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ كَافِيَةً The majority of Muslim jurists want the opinion that we may seek assistance in fighting deviators who rebel against Muslims, seeking the assistance of non-Muslims or taking their arms if Muslims do not suffice. And this is not supporting Muslims, non-Muslims against Muslims. Actually, it is supporting Muslims and establishing Islam itself. And I know we quotes here, and he says, وَقَالَ الشَّافِعِي وَآخَرُونَ إِنْ كَانَ الْكَافِرُ حَسَنَ الرَّأْيِ فِي الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَدَعَتِ الْحَاجَةُ إِلَى الْإِسْتِعَانَةِ بِهِ أَسْتَعِينُ بِهِ if the unbeliever has a, have a good opinion, has a good opinion of Muslims, and there is need to seek his assistance, I would take his assistance. If not, then it is disliked. It's not an issue of kufr and iman, making people apostates and killing them on that basis. You see the point here? It is still taught, and I just recently had reviewed the curricula of Saudi schools. It is still in the second, in the second secondary school, in the second grade of the secondary school. Nawaqidul Islam, the 10 of Nawaqidul Islam are still part of the educational system. How would you expect people not to rebel against their government when you teach them so? And we're now entering another war now where we're seeking, or the Muslim world is seeking the assistance of the rest of the world in fighting ISIS. Big question mark. It is part also of the preparatory course for Jami'at al-Imam Muhammad ibn Saud. I have the curriculum. It's part of the curriculum in Aqidah, Islamic dogma. Now this is not only, these are not only, we just mentioned three, but there's a huge difference. The rest are ten. One of them is the third actually is anyone who does not excommunicate a non-Muslim is anyone who does not judge a mushrik, an associator, as an associator, is an apostate. This is number three comes in the list of, between the brackets, Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Forgive me for this. Big question mark. So I'm talking to the Saudi government here. They should rethink. They should really rethink the educational system and start producing something that goes with the rest of the Muslim world. Because these principles are not, I mean, the first is agreed upon. Anyone who worships idols is not a Muslim. But the second, anyone who has means between him and God, which applies on the majority of Muslims is something that is controversial. It's a fiqh issue. A tawassul is a fiqh issue. It's not a doctrinal or theological issue. The same with seeking assistance from non-Muslims. Let's take an example. Magicians, black magic, or witchcraft. Also, it is included in the 10 principles that bring people outside Islam that anyone who practices sihr, black magic, is a kafir, is a non-Muslim. This is what ISIS is doing now. They're not killing people who practice witchcrafts. They are killing people, forgive me, Sheikh Hamza, for this. They're killing people who are writing Quranic talismans. They bring Sufis, men of Allah. They executed dozens of scholars because they are Sufis. 
They executed dozens of men of Allah. You know, in every village, there are great men of Allah. People sometimes visit and they do ruqya. They read Quran for people or they write some verses of the Quran for people to carry for shifa. Something that was done from the early days of, of Islam. Nothing wrong with it. But they call them black magicians. And they execute them sometimes from top of a building, sometimes by, by missiles, by rockets, sometimes by dynamites. dynamites. It's, and they take it from these principles. If we want to follow the list, there will be a lot of wonders. I will just, this will do. This will do, inshallah. But it shows to us that as long as we base our aqidah on this classification of Tawheed al-Uluhiyya and Tawheed al rububiya we're going to produce fanatics. As long as we base our educational system on such principles of Nawaqid al-Islam, then we're going to have a mess. As I mentioned before, Imam al-Sanusi mentions in one of his books, Al-Muqaddimat, these seven categories of non-believers and the reasons why they are non-believers. But this is taught to scholars. And this does not apply on ordinary Muslims. It doesn't go to a, an ordinary Muslim and tell him, oh, you did this, you're wrong, then you're a kafir. This is to, to trace the roots of why, for example, Christians are considered non-believers or why atheists are considered non-believers. He gives the reasoning for this into seven reasons. We see here the huge difference between the approach of the Ash'aris and the Maturidis to the teaching of Aqidah and the approach of these new groups or the approach of some in some parts of the Islamic world. We are all one body and we are all Muslims united and we support the Saudi government in its war against ISIS, but we want also them to do some reform in order to discourage people from joining ISIS. And also we need to do some reform in our curricula in the Islamic world, whether it is Syria or Egypt or Morocco, somewhere else. We need to produce a young Muslim who knows that killing a non-Muslim is haram. We need to produce a young Muslim who knows that breaching a covenant is forbidden in Islam. People didn't know. A lot of people don't know. You know, the first time I traveled in the, in the non-Islamic world, it was 1991, and it was to Sweden, just up to the north. It was the first non-Muslim country I ever visited. It was just directly to Sweden. And getting on with the Muslim community there, the first fatwas I started receiving questions, people wanted fatwas, was, well, are we allowed to cheat? Are we allowed to work in the black market and still get the social benefits? Are we allowed to do so and so? And all types of fatwas people tried to get from us. I used to tell them, no, you're a citizen of this country or you're a, a resident of this country. You have to respect the laws. There's no way no one single, no one single jurist in the past would give you a fatwa to breach the law of the country in which you live. Actually, Imam Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, in his book, Al-Siyar uh, al-Kabir, is a wonderful book. Al Imam al-Sarakhsi made a commentary on it. It's published in five volumes. There's a huge section on al-Musta'min, Kitab al-Musta'minin, people who come to visit us in the Islamic world under a contract. So from, from a legal point of view, a dhimmi and a musta'min and a, musta and a mu'ahid are equal. So a dhimmi is a non-Muslim living in our country. Mu'ahid is a non-Muslim living in his own country but under contract. And the musta'min is a non-Muslim visiting our countries. And they are all equal. There's no difference between them in terms of rights and protection. And this section on the musta'mineen, Imam al-Sarakhsi says that it is the toughest section of fiqh. And when they used to, to test the fuqaha, they would test them from the section of al mustaminin And it's amazing. It's amazing. I would like to translate parts of that into the English language just to show how much wealth we have of, of international law. This is international law, part of it. For example, if Sheikh Hamza was mentioning that we cannot as individual wage 
war against countries, even if we are a, a large group in a Muslim country. Now, actually, the opposite is very beautiful. When a non-Muslim visits our country, even if he comes without a legal permission into our country, if any Muslim gives him security, safety, shelter, says he is my guest, under my protection, any Muslim, including women, including slaves, including children, no one can touch him, not even the government. Not even the government, he's protected. The word of one Muslim goes against all Muslims when protecting the life, the blood of, of a non-Muslim. Even against the government itself. And there was some instances. During the time of Sayyidina Umar, there was an army and one slave in the, on the Muslim side had some, some interest in protecting the rest, the opponent, the army. So he sent an arrow with a, a letter in it saying that you are all safe, giving them security. They presented this letter. There was a controversy. This is a slave. Does his word go for Muslims or doesn't? They went to Sayyidina Umar. He said, it goes for all Muslims. And they were, they were all given security. And war stopped because of the one word given even against the will of the commander of the army and even without the knowledge of the ruler, the caliph himself. So you could, you see here a beautiful image. So this is why when we go to the books of fiqh, I dig it out here some examples. When Al-Imam Ibn Nujayim says in Al-Shbah wa Nadair, quoting several references from the Hanafi school, that you cannot tell a non-believer that he is a kafir because it upsets him. You're not supposed to tell him that you're a kafir or you're an infidel or... You see, the word infidel here was not used by Muslims. And we do not use it to address non-Muslims. It's used only in polemics, in theological discussions, in, inside closed rooms. We don't go to the public and tell them, we and you, we are Muslims, you are non-Muslims. It's degradation of, of human lives. And we're supposed to, to live together with smile at the face of each other. Muslims, non-Muslims, we living here in this country or they are living with, uh, with us in our country. It's a very important principle. When Ibn Abidin says in his hashia, وَظُلْمُ الذِّمِّيِّ أَشَدْ Oppression against non-Muslims has severe punishments. is tougher. Because they're supposed to be under our protection or we're supposed to be the, the stronger, more powerful. It's, it's ridiculous. This is why I, told about, I talked about tolerance and the principle of tolerance. Muslims did not understand tolerance as it is understood now. Taking pain. This is how the root in Latin suggests. Taking pain in order to bear up with the rest or with the other minorities or whatever. No, Muslims did not understand it. Taking pain, they considered that a pleasure. It's their duty towards Allah. It's, it's the rights of the people. It's not like the taking pain, it's a painful process to tolerate others and live with them despite that we don't like this or, or that. They never understood this, uh, non, the relationship with non-Muslims as pain-taking process with tolerance. They understood it as obligation from Allah to treat them well. This is why we find in the books of fiqh that Backbiting a non-Muslim is as bad as backbiting a Muslim. Because the society is supposed to have some social coherence, some understanding, some... You can't face your neighbor with a frown every day. And the American people are not your enemies. <laughs> they are your fellow citizens and they deserve from you a smile. And I would quote here the hadith of the Prophet wasallam. Having a smile in front of your brother is an act of charity. ISIS goes further and further to challenge every Islamic principle which Rasulullah laid for us. And one of these 
most important examples is protecting covenants with non-Muslims. I gave the example in the book of Hilf al-Fudul, the famous treaty which was done between Arabs before Islam to protect the oppressed, to support the oppressed in Mecca. The Prophet ﷺ attended this. It was before the message. And he said later on, That's is the covenant. If I am called for now, I would sign or I would join. Now, the world has come to an agreement to stop enslaving human beings. Muslims signed the Geneva Treaty 1922 and later on 1956, if I, if I remember well, or 57. And the Muslim world signed a country after another. Saudi Arabia is included and Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Morocco, the Islamic world, they signed this treaty. Actually, this treaty binds us Muslims because we agreed, let's say the West is our enemy, okay. If this is what ISIS wants, okay, the West is our enemy, okay. Well, we agreed with our enemy that we don't enslave them, they don't enslave us. Now tell me, in whose interest is this treaty? It is in the best interest of Muslims. Because if we breach it and they choose to enslave us, Muslims, including Muslim women, will be enslaved in every war between Muslims and non-Muslims. Protecting, guarding this treaty now is in the best interests of Muslims. And no individual have authority to breach it. And even one Muslim government cannot breach it against the consensus of Muslim governments. To that extent, Islamic laws goes. Now you find ISIS coming to enslave non-Muslims. And who amongst non-Muslims? The Yazidis, who lived for thousands of years in Iraq, who have been protected for centuries by Muslim caliphates. The latest is the Ottoman Caliphate. They never forced them into Islam, and they never deported them. They were treated like the people of the book. And this basic or foundation of treating non-Muslim sects or Muslim sects, according to the book of Allah, has reference. It is the opinion of Al-Hanafi school and the Malikite school, with proofs such as the hadith in the Bukhari about the Magians, Sunnu bihim sunnata ahli al-kitab. Imam Malik also uses the hadith when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent a squad of his companions to fight polytheists. He told them to call these polythe polytheists to Islam. If they accept it, okay. If they don't, then charge them taxes. If they don't pay taxes, then fight with them, which means Taxes can be accepted from all non-Muslims, not only the people of the book. And this is the position of the Malikite school, of the Hanafite school, the only position that was practiced in the Middle East. The only position that was practiced in the Middle East with all Muslim and non-Muslim minorities. Four centuries. Alawites, Duru's, those are offshoots of Islam, considered legally non-Muslims, if they claim to be Muslims and pray and embrace Islam, we don't mind, of course, but many of them claim to be not Muslim, non-Muslims. However, they have been treated as the people of the book with their life being guaranteed and not being forced into Islam. La ikraha fi deen. And this is where the verse applies, especially by these two schools. Now, why would ISIS, after centuries, breach all of the covenants of previous governments and caliphates and declare all of a sudden that the Yazidis are non-Muslims and must be treated as non-Muslims and must be executed, they accept Islam or, not, or be executed and their women and children be enslaved. Without even a warning, telling them, 
deporting them or Muslims never, and this is after reading dozens of books, I would say hundreds of books in history and thousands of books in history, Islamic law and other subjects, I would tell you that Muslims never considered themselves having rights to the land they conquered more than its original tenants. This is why they never thought of deporting any Muslims, any non-Muslims from Syria or Egypt. They never thought of destroying the history, the monuments of these people in their lands. Because they considered themselves guests coming in, ruling. These people were there before us. Let them be there. Our job is to respect them. Their job is to not to transgress against us. Such was the relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims. For ISIS now to come all of a sudden, as they say in their statement, I read their statements, I read hundreds of pages of their works, I had to read a lot of rubbish and nonsense. <laughs> they sent, they just decided, after reflecting upon the Yazidis' doctrine, they decided these people are non-Muslims, they are apostates, they should be killed if they don't accept Islam. So they just invaded Sinjar Mountain, invaded their territories, and just took them like that. With thousand years of contracts and covenants in that area being just torn apart by the words of one crazy man. This is not Islam. No one would say this is Islam. I have actually one example. It was Cyprus during the time of Imam Malik himself. And this story is quoted in the Kitab al-Amwal of Abu Ubaid al-Qasim ibn Salam. It's a marvelous book. It has so many beautiful stories. It is called al-Amwal actually, but it has full section on how to treat non-Muslims in international law. And in one example he gives, Cyprus was conquered by Muslims. And there was a covenant, a treaty, where there were some Muslims in Cyprus and some non-Muslims from Cyprus within the Islamic world to guarantee the uh, peace treaty or truce, I would say. All of a sudden, people of Cyprus, provoked by the Byzantine Empire, they breached the promise and they killed the Muslims they had in Cyprus. There was a question posed to Imam al-Awza'i, to Imam Malik, and other scholars, including al ibn Sa'ad, in that time, and their answers are elaborated, mentioned, they are quoted. And all of them agreed on that we cannot breach the promise on our side. They said, غدرن بغدر لا يصلح. They breach, we breach, then we're equal. It doesn't work. They sent non-Muslims safe, guaranteeing their safety. They sent them back. They didn't breach the promise. They declared war and informed them ahead of time. We're coming to fight. Prepare yourselves. And they won the war face to face. This is the bravery. Muslims fight face to face. But when a non-Muslim throws his weapon or turns his back, the Muslim fighter is not allowed to follow him or to, call, or to kill him. And the hadith of Usama Ibn Zayd is well known to every Muslim when Usama was fighting with someone and he was about to kill him. And the, the other man, the non-Muslim, was about to kill Usama. Usama had a sword above his head, wanted to kill him. The man said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. It was well known around Arabia. You say it, you save your life. The man said it, but Usama ibn Zayd killed him. It was narrated to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet was never seen angry as he was seen angry upon that news. And repeated. قتلته بعد أن قاله. You killed him after he said it. After he said it. After he said it. The Prophet sent the blood money, 100 camels, to the family of the person. Was saying, ماذا أصنع بلا إله إلا الله? What shall I do with لا إله إلا الله? But these people of ISIS, do, they do not respect لا إله إلا الله. They do not respect human life. They do not respect human life in Islam. Is worthier than Al-Ka'bah itself as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam describes to us. I don't think in any time of Islamic history we had such a challenge which we need to unite ourselves now as Muslims, especially Muslim scholars, to fight. And here I would encourage Muslim governments, Muslim governments, 
to have scholars, councils of scholars, laying the policies how to fight ISIS. ISIS is a religious group, is an Islamic group. You cannot fight ISIS based on security alone. You cannot stop the spread of extremism based on the counsels given by security experts or intelligence experts or defense experts. You have to have Muslims, scholars telling you how to save the minds of our next generation from being brainwashed. War starts in the minds of people. War starts in the minds of people. We may defeat ISIS now, but if we don't defeat its ideology, we will have another generation coming to fight us again after a few decades. This is why it's time for Muslim governments to have scholars deciding on how to defeat the ideology of ISIS. And this would be only by reviving Sunni Islam, mainstream Islam, Islam of the four madhabs, Islam of tasawwuf, not Islam of tatarruf, Islam of rahmah, Islam of hikmah. That Islam which survived for, 50, for 14 centuries will survive to the end of time. That Islam has a room for every human being. That Islam is have, has room for every difference. That Islam allows everyone to express his opinions with the best and most respected way. That Islam brings actually life, not death. Brings light, not darkness. And this is the Islam which we have. Jazakumullahu khayran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah. Uh, thank you all for coming. I think Sheikh Mohammed, just because of the time and he's traveling, um, he's going to sign some books. Is that correct? Yeah, I think. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping, I, I invited him back again, inshallah. I'm hoping he'll come back um, for uh, time, uh, more time with us. We were fortunate to have him during the time that he was here, and many people here benefited from his knowledge. But I want to thank him and thank all of you. Uh, we, I think uh, Sheikh Mohammed said it very well that we have to educate our young people. Um, we're living in a very different world than the pre-modern world. Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya recently uh, made an argument that the covenant of Medina, which was full enfranchisement of the other communities, was never abrogated, and he uses a Shafi'i source for that, and said that there are many models uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu allowed for his community that are appropriate for the times and places, and this is the job of the scholars, and we're fortunate to have scholars like uh, Sheikh Muhammad, um, and he's done incredible work, his work on the Mawani' uh, al-Hudud, Iqamat al-Hudud, very important work. And this, this book itself um, is an obligation binding on him, and he knows that because these are fara'id, kifaya, and if nobody's doing it, they, they become uh, individual obligations on the people that are capable of doing it. So I want to thank all of you. For those of you who haven't been to Zaytuna College before, I hope that you find out more about it, and uh, you're all certainly welcome. And um, for uh, those of you who are old friends, Inshallah, may you continue to be so. Barakallahu fikum, inshallah. We, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, to um, bless our community, to pr provide protection uh, and well-being for our communities, uh, for this local community that we're in, and, and inshallah, to make us bearers of light and not bearers of darkness, to make us people that uh, are welcoming and, and loving and not people that are put off others and and engender hatred and, and other qualities. And, and, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, help the people of Syria and of Iraq uh, who've been under incredible affliction. And in many ways, our country has a lot of responsibility uh, because of the misadventures in Iraq that really opened up a lot of doors 
uh, to this. The pe Iraqi people had never done anything against us. Um, and, and so I'm hoping, I was actually asked to testify in Congress about encouraging us to allow Syrian uh, immigrants um, or really refugees into the country. And I think it's important that we actually lobby for that um, because these are people that you know are in, in, in incredible hardships. And I'll end by saying one thing. Muhammad Mawlud al-Yaqubi al-Musawi, one of the great Mauritanian Mujaddideen, said that this world is a darul ibtila, it's a place of tribulation. The Quran says, Liabluukum ayukum ahsanu amra. God created, part of the reason that we're created is to test us, to see which of us are the best in actions. Sheikh Muhammad uh, uh, Ali he said, um, same, uh, similar, same name. He said that tests happen uh, one of two ways. You're either tested in yourself, which forces you to go to others for help. So maybe you have a sickness, you have to go to a doctor. Uh, you, you're impoverished, you need to go to find a loan. Uh, you, you lose mobility, you need help. Um, or you're tested by others in need coming to you. And he said, if those who are in need come to you and you don't have a test in yourself and yet you don't help them, then Allah will give you tests in yourself that force you to others because it's the way that he teaches empathy. When we don't have empathy for others, we're forced into situations that force us to understand what human suffering means when we feel it ourselves. And it's quite tragic that many people uh, do not have empathy uh, when, they, when they see people suffering, but when they themselves suffer. And um, this is something we're seeing a lot of suffering right now, and, and these people certainly need help. Um, they're sleeping. I mean, these are people that were in very good conditions now, some of them very good uh, educations, and they're literally sleeping in the streets in, in Greece um, because uh, they've fled this horrific situation. So um, this is also the plight of the Palestinians. I, I say to the Syrians, welcome to the Palestinian club because the Palestinians have been suffering for a very long time also. So there's a lot of people joining this club unfortunately, and it's a horrible club to be in. But those of us who aren't in that club, I think we should take more seriously helping those people that are in that unfortunate category of being victims of oppression. Because if we don't, then we might find ourselves in that situation, and it'll be a very different experience. Jazakumullah khairan wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.